passing on to Judy, uh, Judy Dia, um, who's a writer uh, involved magazine, and um, is going to be talking uh, about addressing global crisis and looking in depth at uh, Lebanon and architecture post explosion. Thanks, Mithila. Um, so I'm Judy. I'm a writer at Involved, uh, founded by a group of students in Cardiff that you are probably familiar with. I'm also a student at the AA, uh, doing my part two. And I'm a member of an organization that I'll talk a bit more about later called Impact Lebanon. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen to start presenting once again. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's a lot that I'm trying to wrap up in this presentation, but I'm mainly going to talk through two different uh, scenarios in Beirut and how architecture played a role in both. One being the October Revolution in 2019, and the second being uh, the post-disaster phase in August leading up to now. Um, so the title of the presentation is The Architecture of Rehabil Rehabilitation, Tackling the Multifaceted Crisis in Beirut. And following it, there will be a, a one graduate and two students from the AA uh, presenting different approaches to post-disaster Beirut. And you'll have time after that to ask um, me and them uh, any questions you may have. So in Lebanon, uh, due to legacy, uh, a legacy of decades of civil war, as well as a skewed real estate in investment, which emerged as a, prog a product of political greed, this heavily stripped the public of all things public. So all forms of wave, uh, um, social welfare. So here surface massive craters in the foundations of public health care, public education, transport, infrastructure, energy provision, and last but not least, public space. Beirut, the capital of Lebanon and its largest city, exists as a web of privately owned vacant spaces. The lack of open space within the city is distinctly reflective of the lack of correspondence between its inhabitants. The post-war political agenda was simple, maintain segregation, to set apart each person from the herd. The most futile way to achieve this was to eliminate spaces where people could meet or conglomerate. After the post-war construction boom, land became a commodity, which has in turn diminished the potential for spontaneous activity to emerge within the city. Flash forward to 2019, mass demonstrations erupt origi originating at Martyrs Square, which has historically been a, a center of confrontation in Beirut. Numbers are seen to be growing expeditiously, satellite protests emerge at individual urban centers, and the lack of space that we just spoke about calls for the blockage of streets. Protesters flood into main roads, and in the face of rampant corruption and nepotism, numbers continued to grow exponentially. Calls for reform amplified, and the lack of public space, which initially seemed uh, initially seemingly, seemingly appeared as a weapon of segregation, proved to be a double-edged sword with regards to those in control. So as human density grew, so did proximity. Proximity in people's thought, their vision, and their demands. The collective energy in turn activated an unforeseen process of dissolution of sectarian ties. This dissolution consequently instigated conversation, and these conversations required, required their own grounds. In consequence, the Lebanese population began to find their own way to these grounds, salvaging private spaces, establishing makeshift places of convention, and primarily places of public discourse. So the map here shows you which spaces they began to infiltrate, mainly Martyr Square, but also a, a building called the Egg, which was um, a, a theater in ruins. And finally, a main road, which is the Ring Road. These three plots fell into three categories, a square, a building, and a street. Primarily, they're central in terms of their physical qualities, which have contributed to their immersion as critical front lines within the revolution but supplementarily in the digital realm, in terms of the continual media coverage, visual communication, and journalistic material, which was proliferating on the internet at the time. So what we found here was people needed to find spaces of focus in order to have their agenda communicated more clearly. The internet served as a, a vital means of communication and organization, but you can't really create disruption online. They needed to block out these spaces. Martyr Square is in the center of downtown Beirut, a business hub, a social hub, um, as well as an enterprise hub. And taking over that space meant disrupting day-to-day -day life 
and disrupting day-to-day -day government activity. So all the different uh, people coming from all the different areas in Lebanon and meeting in the space meant that normal life came to a halt. The egg, since the civil war being a space in destruction, was finally reactivated and reactivated constructively. Uh, talks were held there, conventions. Um, it became a, spacious, a space of organization, but also a space of rebellion. And finally, the ring road serves as an example of many other roads, but um, I see this as the entry port or the exit point of Beirut. So blocking this road meant blocking access to the city if you were not part of this revolution. Fast forward to August 4th, 2020, uh, the day of the Beirut explosion, one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history, which pulverized the port and damaged over half the city. The explosion resulted from the de detonation of tons of amino ammonium nitrate, a chemical compound commonly used in agriculture as a high nitrate fertilizer, but which can also be used to manufacture explosives. The cargo of ammonium nitrate had entered Beirut's port on a Maldivian flagged ship, the Roses, in no November 2013, and had been offloaded into Hangar 12 in Beirut's port on October 23 and 24, 2014. I won't speak about the actual event too deeply because you'll see different perspectives of this in the three presentations following, but I will speak about the approach after in terms of rehabilitation. And there'll be a series of maps and diagrams that give you some insight into the level of destruction. So there was primary, secondary, and tertiary destruction, each with a certain level of damage to the buildings, um, healthcare units, spaces of education, businesses, and so on. And these were approached with a different level of urgency for each. The explosion killed 218 people and wounded 7,000, of whom at least 150 acquired a physical disability, caused untold psychological harm, and damaged 77,000 apartments, displacing over 300,000 people. At least three children between the ages of 2 and 15 lost their lives. 31 children required hospitalization, 1,000 were injured, and 80,000 children were left without a home. The explosion affected also 163 public and private schools and rendered half of Beirut's healthcare centers non-functional, uh, a reminder that this was amidst the COVID pandemic, and it impacted 56% of private businesses in Beirut, among them startups and young businesses and SMEs. There was extensive, extensive damage to infrastructure, including transport, energy, water supply, and sanitation, and municipal services totaling um, 390 to $475 million in losses. According to the World Bank, the explosion caused an estimated 3.8 to 4.6 billion in material damage amidst, amidst an economic crisis which was escalating at the time. So here you can see a summary of the infrastructure impact, housing definitely being the most impacted area, but uh, as well as healthcare with 17 damaged hospitals, the majority of which are in central Beirut, education, 26 damaged nurseries, 72 damaged schools, eight damaged university, universities, and uh, businesses with over 2,400 businesses with low damages, almost 4,000 with medium damages and 500 with high damages, almost unable to reopen. Finally, culture, um, a central aspect of life in Beirut was also a victim of the crisis, eight historical areas being damaged, 480 heritage buildings and 160 additional buildings with special historic features. So the situation uh, happened at a time where Beirut was without government coordinated uh, uh, aid and clearly communicated relief or a response plan. Because of this, many people across the country from different backgrounds, Lebanese and non-Lebanese, took their own initiative and decided to act quickly in support of the stricken people of Beirut. This found small initiatives teaming up, larger initiatives setting up um, a series of separate projects and so on. So really Beirut was rebuilt by an army of volunteers, not by government aid. How, how is this related to architecture? In a series of ways. Uh, four of the main functions of these volunteers was central to rebuilding. Rebuilding services on the ground, heritage damage assessment and data collection, surveying and monitoring of the actual uh, rebuilding taking place, material conservation and recycling, as well as a series of uh, disconnected aid processes that were vital for this to actually take place, fundraising and monetary assistance, medical aid, resource provision, and psychological care. Um, so obviously each initiative had their own processes and functions in place, but I'm going to speak primarily through the lens of Impact Lebanon because this is where my personal perspective lies. 
Um, Impact Lebanon is a social incubator which was founded in London around the time of the beginning of the revolution in 2019, primarily for education and awareness purposes. Um, when, uh, when August 4th took place, Impact Lebanon set up a crowdfunding campaign in the immediate aftermath of the explosion, which ultimately raised over six million pounds by January 4th, 2021. Thanks to contributions of over 171,000 donors, the average amount donated per individual was 37 pounds. Um, thanks to the additional contributions of third-party fundraisers such as Auction House Sotheby's, as well as a number of corporate donors, we managed to raise a total of 9.2 million pounds. So the breakdown of the funding can be seen here as follows. Why is this relevant? Because this fundraising was crucial um, to, to the functions of all the separate bodies of infrastructure and care in Beirut by civil society. And these can be broken down as follows. Residential, with the bulk of um, the money being dedicated to rehabilitating um, homes of the people in Beirut, hospital and medical body relief, um, micro and small business relief, lost income support, medical and mental health support, and other. So in terms of residential rehabilitation, um, these funds, obviously in use by the series of initiatives and NGOs, which Impact Lebanon supported, led to 1,807 residential units being rehabilitated to date, as well as um, a total number of 2,000 being the projected expected number, and 5,500 individuals residing in these rehabilitated units so far. And this is a map of the distribution of the units, as well as the level of damage that they had experienced before the rehabilitation. On top of that, uh, seeing heritage as crucial to Beirut's identity and character, 168 uh, heritage units were rehabilitated to date, with 210 being the projected number to expect, as well as uh, giving homes back to 439 individuals which resided in these units previously, many of which having, having resided in them before the civil war even. So I'm just going to give some insight into a few of the different um, NGOs and initiatives which are involved in this rehabilitation and kind of to clarify the different forms of activities and operations that they conduct and also to give a sense of um, connection to architecture and how this was crucial to um, bringing life back to the city. So Baitna Baitak, for example, is an initiative that is, uh, that's core focus is rehabilitating homes for the people of Beirut. And IMPACT has funded three rehabilitation projects conducted by Baitna Baitak. One of them being the rehabilitation of the external structure of 11 buildings located in Magim Khayil, which is one of the central streets of Beirut and one which experienced the most damage during the explosion due to its proximity to the port. 58 residential units and SMEs affected by the blast, specifically focusing on those uh, highly vulnerable individuals with poor living conditions, and the rehabilitation of the external structure of buildings located in Khanda and Ghani. So Baitna Baitak was specifically focused on material conservation, renovation, and monitoring post-renovation. Another initiative with a slightly different focus uh, was entitled Catalytic Action. Catalytic Action is an NGO which started a project called Kanya Makan, uh, aimed at co-creating children's environments through narratives in the Carantina neighborhood of Beirut. The project addresses the needs of young residents in the Carantina neighborhood as a response to the dev devastating explosion. It rehabilitated the Carantina public park, which was impacted by the blast, in order to welcome to the, children, the children and their families safely. The project also aimed at providing children with a much needed safe place, a place where they are familiar with within their neighborhood and towards which they feel a sense of ownership. So this space kind of acted as a therapeutic uh, plot within Beirut for these children, which during this, uh, during the aftermath of the blast, blast were very much overlooked, both in terms of their mental, mental health and their safety, but also in terms of the importance of, of recreation in their day-to-day -day lives and in their development through that age. Um, another uh, another organization which was supported was in, in, is entitled Embrace Lebanon. Uh, Embrace is a local nonprofit organization working towards mental health awareness and suicide prevention in Lebanon. Impact helped fund the operations of the Embrace Lifeline 24/7, which aims to provide on the ground psychological first aid and set up a walk-in mental health clinic. So in Beirut, a large problem can be a, a sense of privacy within tight spaces especially in, in, in situations where several families live in the same um, home with refugees and so on and low-income families. 
So it's super, it's very important for there to exist walk-in mental health clinics that can be accessed, that provide a sense of a privacy and salvation to these families who are not always able to pick up the phone from the comfort of the privacy of their own home. So building a, a few walk-in clinics uh, in the center of the city was crucial to the survival and the activity of Embrace, which in turn has uh, contributed to the mental health and safety of thousands of people within the city. House of Christmas addresses a different area, which is a heritage building. So it's an organization set up in 2017 with the aim of um, originally reaching out to families in need across uh, Lebanon to help them regain their dignity and achieve sustainability by providing them with targeted support to stabilize and strengthening their households. Uh, but after the August 4 blast, House of Christmas extended its scope to one, help preserve heritage buildings and their residents in Magam Khail and Jemaizeh, and two, provide strategic support, including rehabilitation and capacity building to micro and small businesses in the areas of Jemaize, Magam Khail, and Burj Hammoud. So because there were quite a large number of initiatives focusing on housing rehabilitation in general, they shifted their focus, specifically being targeted to heritage buildings. And a, a, a pretty uh, dominant reason for this is that a lot of the uh, families or the individuals that live in these heritage buildings tend to be owners of the older age range um, who urgently required assistance and safety within their homes. Lebanon Needs um, is another initiative which was mainly focused on the medical center within Beirut uh, and the infrastructure of these medical centers. Um, Lebanon Needs are currently working on a holistic community health project, which includes supporting peripheral hospitals to help them with repairs, supporting communities and villages with task forces trained and monitored by them to recruit, refer, implement, and follow up with underprivileged populations on health recommendations, and creating holistic programs, including health and social services by partnering with like-minded NGOs and initiatives. But first and foremost, uh, post-BLAST, they shifted all their attention to rehabilitating the eight majorly damaged hospitals in the center of Beirut. Rise Up Lebanon, finally, is a grassroots initiative which was spontaneously launched after the BLAST to support the main pillar of the economic cycle in the affected neighborhoods of Beirut, micro, small, and medium businesses. Beirut is a commerce hub, and many of these businesses were uh, started by people that were already struggling to, to uh, sustain them within the economic crisis, and for, for a majority of them, the, the explosion almost rendered them unable to continue with their businesses. Impact funded Rise Up Lebanon's efforts to support local businesses affected by the explosion. And the project aims at rehabilitating the shops affected by the blast through implementing a needs assessment, filling BOQs, bidding with suppliers, and following up on the work until the shops were operational again. To date, Rise Up Lebanon has rehabilitated 106 businesses which supported 617 individuals financially. So this is the end of my uh, part of the presentation, but I hope this gave some insight into how these different initiatives within Beirut um, have worked on an architectural scale across the city in order to kind of um, resurrect all the different uh, industries that were rendered paralyzed almost by the blast. Um, and also a note to say, how civil society's actions can sometimes in turn replace those of governments. But for many of us, many of Beirut citizens, we have started to reject our own resilience. So we've started to say it's time that we do not only rely on civil society, we don't only rely on our own resilience, but demand more. Um, and the three projects that follow will kind of uh, give different perspectives of those approaches. So one, looking at how the lack of public space in Beirut uh, has forced or could force citizens to find their own possibilities. One, um, at different forms of energy and sustenance within the city. And a third, uh, which is kind of an anti-resilience approach to the city, looking at how um, we, we need to find our own pockets of independence that promote our own agendas within Beirut. So with that, I'll hand it over to um, Riyadh to start with. Hello, I'm Riyadh. Uh, I'm starting my fifth year at the AA now. Um, and I will present my um, fourth year project that I did last year uh, called Deep Requisition. So I'm going to share my screen now. And yeah, we will be taking questions later. So if anyone has any question, save it for later, I guess.
deep requisition. The project proposes a gradual reclamation of the roofs of Beirut, an occupied territory which is currently used to compensate for government inaptitude. Here is a series of neighboring roofs in the neighborhood of Hamra. They are used purely for infrastructural purposes. Territory of Beirut. Beirut is an environment that has failed its people. In the absence of public space in Beirut, children play on the streets and in car parks. People attempt to domesticate the streets by placing furniture on the pavements, creating informal, finite, common spaces in the public realm. It is a city that has been in crisis for many years, and today, once again, it is in severe crisis. As the public institutions fail to supply enough power and water, the people of Beirut find themselves forced to make use of fuel power generators and water tanks. The failed state has resulted in self-initiated form of governance. With the necessity to compensate for the absence of the state in providing vital needs and services, the people have created informal forms of governance at the scale of the residential building to collectively self-govern. The inhabitants of each household must choose one person to represent them the building council, which in return elects one person to be the building trustee or treasurer. This person must hire a concierge to take care of the building's common amenities. The trustee bears the responsibility of those common spaces, which are the car park, core, and the rooftop, which is currently used purely for infrastructural functions. However, the rooftop is owned by the collective of homeowners of that building and is to be used by the collective of tenants. Unfortunately, this is impossible. The project proposes the clearing of rooftops of that infrastructure in order to reclaim it. The people of Beirut have shown a will to reclaim the city. In the 2019 protests, People expressed distrust in the public institutions and reclaimed the streets as their own. One of the tactics used by the protesters was placing carpets and living room furniture on the asphalt. As part of the riots, the protesters climbed on top of monumental buildings to claim them as the people's. When the COVID-19 virus hit Beirut and the government declared the state of emergency, a lockdown was imposed to reduce the spread of the virus and halt the protests. However, people climbed on top of their own flat roofs and sound chants. The rooftop being the furthest floor from the street, it is the furthest one can be from the public realm. It is the deepest part of Beirut. Following that logic, to recapture the city, the people of Beirut must seize the rooftops. The project recommends the identification of the weaponized object by which the government exercises this occupation of common territory. These symbols of inaptitude are water reservoirs, electric generators, solar panels, air conditioning units, satellite dishes, and antennas. As a response to this occupation, the project proposes the construction of technical platforms that take the form of monsters. The ironic appearance of the infrastructural objects aims to stand as a critique of their necessary existence, in a way, unmasking the infrastructure. These dark, mysterious figures sit on top of residential buildings, enclosing all the water tanks, generators, and other objects of occupation reclaiming the rooftops as the peoples. Apart from being symbolic evidence denouncing governmental neglect, these creatures would help reclaim the rooftops for the people. The project proposes that the roofscape be actively reclaimed through architecture. The rooftop is finite and offers an escape from home and the street. 
In that sense, it exists as an absolute roofscape, independent of the street and the context. Once cleared, the roofscape offers the space to empower existing community structures and enhance their social activities. The space where the community and the creatures that were once a burden could exist in symbiosis. A space where the building council could meet, where the neighbors could have social gatherings, where one of the residents could give some sort of class to make extra profit in a time of crisis, or even host an informal market. By claiming a space that is today unused or even misused, the project proposes to transform these spaces into third places for the people of Beirut. On a territorial scale, the deployment of those monsters becomes a strategy of gradual territorial reclamation. The reclamation is a spatial one. These creatures would then gradually reclaim historic houses monumental buildings and public institutions in the city, maintaining them and caring for them under proper governance. The reclamation strategy is a critique of government and aptitude, a spatial requisition of the people's roofs, and therefore a reconquering of the city. Well, if there are any questions, uh, please note them so we can ask them after all three speakers are done. Uh, but next, we'll have Philip um, with his uh, project of his fifth year, which was also a diploma honors project at the AA. So, Philip, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Thanks Judy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, I'll share um, my screen. Uh, so the project I want to share with you is my fifth year project. It doesn't deal directly with um, the explosion of the port of Beirut, but attempts to introduce um, structural change uh, in the provision of social services um, in the city. Um, it kind of explores how to work with the grassroots initiatives to propose a network of um, civic infrastructures that can start to generate uh, change in the context of, of uh, Beirut. Um, so it's a video and I, here we go. Right. I dream of never being called resilient again in my life. I'm exhausted by strength. I want support. I want softness. I want to be amongst kin, not patted on the back for how well I take a hit or for how many. In the name of resilience, crises, care, and civic infrastructures in Beirut. This project is an urban response to the different crises that are currently ravaging Lebanon and the city of Beirut. These crises are articulated around two main manifestations. First, the lack of basic public infrastructures of care resulting from a complete disregard of the population's well-being by the state. And second, the constant adaptation to situations of crises by the Lebanese population that is persistently praised for its resilience, which is nothing but a romanticization of both the resourcefulness and the suffering of the people. While both these manifestations feed from one another, they allowed for the disinvestment of the state and resulted in an institutional disintegration of public infrastructures leaving the population increasingly vulnerable to crises. This project rethinks the nature of infrastructures of care by building a network of localized and decentralized interventions on small parcels dispersed across the city of Beirut. In a context where care to society is completely absent, providing spaces for the citizens to be received with non-commercialized care exposes the possibility of an alternative social contract. But today, as a result of successive crises of all sorts that have kept the population under a constant state of vulnerability and in line with the almost mystical Lebanese resilience, Beirut is witnessing the emergence of an unprecedented social civic movement that is locally providing the desperately needed social services that the state is unwilling to provide to its citizens. It's true, but it's intentional, that's the truth. The government has the need to keep people poor, and that's why there's never been a plan of development, economic development, nothing, nothing. From local charities providing a much needed social safety net to civic collective introducing public debates and from social enterprises to social incubators, from provocative movements to alternative media, these all aim for social and political change and the showcasing of a possible alternative reality revolving around the care for the citizen. 
From their different activities, a few types of spaces emerge. Spaces of distribution, spaces of conversation, spaces of education, spaces of organization, and spaces of broadcasting. These spaces allow the actors to both reach out to the community and organize themselves, and become crucial to improve the well-being of the population. However, due to the multiple crises that have followed the Beirut port explosion, these initiatives are today inscribed in an informal state of social emergency. But this project argues against such a state of emergency, because the means deployed to face it do nothing but perpetuate the failing system of dependency. Instead, the resilient means of the population should be channeled into a civic infrastructural system of active resistance to a neoliberal system that thrives on vulnerability. Because Lebanon is in urgent need of a politics that puts care front and center. But how could architecture contribute to materializing this politics, to putting care at the very center of urban life? By care, however, is not only meant the work people do when directly looking after the physical and emotional needs of others. It is all social capacities and activities involving the nurturing of all that is necessary for the welfare and flourishing of a dignified life in the city. This ambition is translated at the urban level into building civic infrastructures where citizens can both provide care and be received with care on a very local level across the whole urban fabric of Beirut. But the state of this urban fabric is no different from that of society. In fact, these affairs strategies were designed and implemented by the historically hyper neoliberal Lebanese state to the benefit of real estate. Indeed, due to extensive lobbying from private landowners to retain their privileges, the poor implementation of the different master plans designed for the city of Beirut resulted in a subdivision of large parcels into ones that are deemed by the municipal regulations too small to be built on, leaving small landowners with lands that are non-profitable. And this current lack of profit therefore renders the mobilization of these plots favorable for the provision of non-commercialized care. A standardized grid is overlaid over Beirut for the equal repartition of care in order to break the dependency on the politically driven aid that is today used as clientelism propaganda for the political elite across the divisions of the city. So by analyzing the plots of Beirut along the parameters that define instructability, that is surface area, facade width, and depth, 4,476 inconstructible parcels are identified, representing 21% of the total number of parcels in municipal Beirut. Through the deep reach into the urban fabric, their mobilization allows easy and local access to care for the entire population of the city. The redivision of Beirut into small squares of 250 by 250 meters transforms each one of those into a hub for care, articulated around one intervention located on an inconstructible parcel. This ensures that all the citizens of the city are no more than 10 minutes away walking from any intervention. The selection of the parcels is done through a set of parameters that define their suitability to be mobilized. First, they should be vacant. Second, they should only be adjacent to constructed parcels. Otherwise, they could become prey to developers for the consolidation of larger parcels. Third, they should be easily accessible from the main arteries of the neighborhood in order to reach a greater number of people. Fourth, they should be highly visible from traffic along the street to increase the exposure to the interventions. But while the restrictions around these spells forbid the building of foundations, this project explores the design strategies for the construction of light but permanent infrastructures. The ground floor is focused on distribution and conversation. This to accommodate and reach a greater number of people, to increase accessibility, and to create a strong link with the community. The upper floors are dedicated to organization and education, as they require higher levels of privacy. These spaces can accommodate small groups of people for workshops or meetings, and can also be transformed into small private spaces for individual consultations of different sorts. This distinction between ground and upper floors is translated in the structure of the interventions. While the ground floor is an open plan with light elements simply placed on the site, the upper floors are organized around oversized steel structures that start to become recognizable architectural elements, signaling the presence of care across the built environment. The steel beams are bolted to the structures of the neighboring building for support. By excluding vertical structural elements, space is optimized and the interventions are lifted off the ground, removing the need for foundations. But because of the self-organizing and grassroots nature of the spaces, a cost-efficient approach for the design is required. The plummeting value of the local currency by over 90% makes it very difficult to import, and therefore, the selection of locally sourced, recycled, and reused materials becomes crucial for the design of the spaces. But these spaces of care do not only aim at providing a basic social safety net to the population. They, more importantly, want to introduce information. Because 
Because in Lebanon, and in the name of resilience, the state does everything in its power to keep people vulnerable and subjected to their different politics. It actively prevents people from accessing information, understanding the actual role of the state, and imagining a different reality. So the interventions are designed as organisms for information. Repurposed netting curtains that serve as shading systems during the day are used as projection screens during the night, and beams are transformed into LED screens, highlighting the most important news and independent information. But because of social diversity, the needs for care vary between the different neighborhoods. So while for some neighborhoods, urgent humanitarian aid is needed, for others, spaces for civic conversation could suffice, while also increasing the right to the city and amplifying voices that need to be heard. Through this network of highly frictional infrastructures, an environment of care for the citizen is overlaid on the urban fabric of the city as a response to the collective anxieties of living in this uncaring neoliberal country, setting an important precedent for the potential future development of public infrastructures. This project is in conversation with different actors, some of whom you have already heard from. So I've gone back to Beirut to start implementing it by speaking with actors that could potentially contribute to its realization. These can be arranged into three categories. I first started to talk to people from the animating category after explaining to them the way these spaces would be managed. So through a booking system for one or regular interventions for short or long periods of time, depending on their needs, interest was shown by some for collaboration. But the main challenge resided in the planning category. By speaking to a candidate to the last municipal elections, it was made evident that if I were to implement this at the scale of the whole city, a political change from within the municipality is essential, especially to gather political will and to unlock development funds from abroad. And I believe that this is very much possible with the elections next year. Moreover, a member of the urban department within the municipality confirmed that the regulations aren't clear and that only the publicly owned parcels could be mobilized for such a project. He, after further explanations, suggested that the municipality could eagerly allow these types of interventions on private ones for humanitarian purposes, as long as they are movable and disassemblable. My work now becomes about making these interventions seem temporary while actually being able to last until the state recover its legitimacy. Finally, I have started engaging with the makers. Upon visiting steel manufacturers, I was told that the last steel recycling plant had recently closed and that the only remaining construction materials are imported at exorbitant prices. This source the price of construction, which reaffirms the need for external forms of finances. Also, both the engineer and the architect I have contacted believe that putting a simple prefabricated structure would do the job, and that bolting the interventions to the neighboring structures would add unnecessary complications. I had to argue for the architectural language of this project, one that is strikingly recognizable and long-lasting, and they followed up giving me structural advices to make it more feasible while still being legally compliant. Bolting the structure to the neighboring buildings could, for example, be replaced by bolting vertical beams onto prefabricated concrete beams simply placed on the ground. This opens up more design possibilities that I would be interested in pursuing and introduces the need for many more conversations to happen. Um, so that was um, my project. Um, it's, um, it's quite interesting be because after finishing the project um, and it got shared on social media, um, a lot of people kind of responded positively to it uh, and offered help. So, I mean, um, as Charlie said earlier, um, impact can happen, can happen really quickly and you don't really necessarily to have to identify explicitly as an activist to start having an impact in your communities. Um, so, I mean, um, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's, that was me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, so the third uh, presenter will be Lean Hanna. Lean is presenting her third year project. Um, I'm gonna, she's presenting from Beirut as a heads up, and uh, I'm gonna leave it to her. So Lean, uh, go for it. Hello. Okay, I'm gonna start presenting. Okay. So anatomy of a port from consumer culture to agriculture. Beirut was said to have been destroyed seven times, and on August 4, 2020, it was destroyed for an eighth time. It all started at 5.56 p.m. when the fire plumes were first identified in warehouse number 12 in the port of Beirut. As time went on, the smoke thickened and its color kept changing to a darker shape. At 6.08 p.m., the third largest explosion in history originated from warehouse 12, destroying half of the city. Each of these smoke plumes, with their distinct shape and color, provided indications as to the arrangements of goods in the warehouse, showcasing the incompetence and negligence of the ruling class. 
car tires, fireworks, and 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate were stored in the heart of the city, the perfect composition for an atomic bomb. The bomb was of 753 meters high, and its shockwave spread across 6,000 meters from the port, heavily damaging half of the city. Not only is Beirut destroyed today, but the country is facing its worst financial crisis due to the bankruptcy resulting in an inflation rate of more than 87%, a shortage of electricity and fuel, with 60% of Lebanon citizens living below the poverty line. The project therefore questions, what does it mean to be selfish and survive in the face of incompetent decision makers dealing with such emergencies? The work would be focusing on food and energy as the basic fundamental elements for survival. What was once known as the Port of Beirut would become an agriculture hub by which greenhouses host high-valued crops that would be traded between local farmers and consumers as an interface to recreate and embed lost traditions and social values. The work attempts to unveil an interdependent system by which what is planted is then transformed into energy. Organic matter and wheat grains would be composted into methane gas that would then be transformed into electricity. The, pra the practice of agriculture and farming is a science in itself, which is why the research meticulously looks into it. Without going into all the technical details, I'll be showing few components that I've looked into. I first started by understanding the fundamentals of plant growth, such as photosynthesis, the process by which plants use sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide to create oxygen and energy in the form of sugar, which is fundamental for their survival. Another element would be the different types of soil and their specific properties, which always differ from one plant to another. The ammonium nitrate that was stored is a chemical fertilizer, which is why the project focuses on creating a sustainable ecosystem by which what is planted, then eaten, results in compost and organic matter, which is then used as a natural fertilizer for plants due to the high nitrogen and other bacteria responsible for boosting plant growth naturally. It is also crucial to understand the science behind plant nurseries and the way in which some crops grow harmoniously with others. An example would be the chickpea plant, which releases nitrogen bacteria in the soil and therefore enhances the growth around the surrounding plants. It's very important to understand each crop's properties for them to thrive in their given environment, from their spacing to soil volume, to bacterial release, watering and, watering and water quantities, weather accommodation, plant nurseries, natural protection from pests to ground extraction, and finally harvesting. Moving on to the site, the port of Beirut takes up 1.2 kilometers of the city's coastal area. It was, built on, it was built on reclaimed land out of concrete backfill, and 80% of Lebanon's maritime shipping traffic passed through the site, and for many it was the largest and busiest port in the Eastern Mediterranean. The port is divided into three basins. The first responsible for international stocks and shipping, the second for unloading bulk imported stocks, the third for buildings. The port consisted of steel warehouses, some of which used for storing elements ranging from livestock, chemical products, vehicles, to machinery and furniture. Warehouses were also used as offices in parallel to the existing buildings on the site. Other elements would be the weathering steel containers, with the weathering steel containers. The port today is completely damaged. However, the destroyed steel warehouses still stand their ground. The site has been closed to the public ever since August 4, which is why, to better understand my inaccessible site, I tried to come up with a process that would help me detect the available material that can be reused for the entire proposal. As an example, I've looked into this specific area on the site near the silo. I started off by using a high-quality photograph in which I can identify visible material left on the site. I have then overlaid a grid with specific measurements I've extracted from Google Earth. Looking at the specific, looking at the space each material took into the grid, I've estimated the area, and from there, the percentage of available material, such as concrete, rubber, car tires, glass, and aluminum. However, before intervening on site, it's essential to clear the port from all the remaining chemicals and hazardous waste material. Before introducing the proposal, I've started by looking at the different greenhouses across the region to better understand the problematics they impose, ranging from harmful watering system to the use of pesticides in order for the proposal to be a very low tech yet sustainable model that can be adapted anywhere else. For the greenhouse part of the project, the proposal consists of transforming the existing steel warehouse into greenhouses in order to preserve the identity of what was the Beirut port pre-August 4. 
I attempt to repurpose the warehouses by embedding glass into the steel structures and use the remaining container pieces in which crops are planted. These basic technical diagrams showcase the reasoning behind the new design. A platform placed in the center by which compost energy to greenhouse during winter time. As organic matter decomposes in the presence of oxygen, the existing bacteria release heat. Ventilators and a cross ventilation system through window pistons are placed to cool the greenhouse during summertime. The angle of the greenhouse roof is perfectly tilted to collect rainwater and store it in the underground container. Pipes are placed above each container for the water to be pumped out in a harmless water dripping system. To wrap it up after being harvested, the remaining organic matter is collected and stored in the silos. The grain silos in the port have protected the western part of the city. The robust structures, concrete walls facing east, collapse on the spot of the blast. However, the one facing west remains standing, blocking the blast shockwave from reaching the western part of the city with full force. The silos grain facility at the port of Beirut used to store 85% of Lebanon cereals. Leaving the silo as it is today, the proposal looks into repurposing the grain facility into a sustainable energy facility by which organic matter is stored and transformed into electricity to the surrounding neighborhoods. This process occurs through anaerobic decomposition, which is the process in which organic matter decays with the absence of oxygen, creating methane gas, which is then converted to energy within the repurposed structure. Having lived my whole life by the front line of the port, the most crucial aspect and challenge of the proposed master plan was to preserve the identity of the site rather than completely erase what used to be the port of Beirut and the tragedy that had occurred. I divided the agriculture hub into three sections. The first basins functioned for aggregation, storing purposes and processing. The second purely for greenhouse and crop growth. However, each plot has a gathering space near the greenhouse in which people get together, learn and share different methods. Although two greenhouses are found, in, are found in the third basin, it's mainly designed for social interactions. Firstly, greenhouses, greenhouses will be altered into indoor markets, as well as indoor dining that take place as weekly activities, but also gathering spaces in which people get to enjoy their meal and walk through this ur urban agriculture field freely. To demonstrate this, I've got a section through this part of the plot, which shows the different stages and activities that happen within this site. What I hope to achieve through this proposal is a response to the catastrophic emergencies facing the country. My proposal attempts to solve multiple needs simultaneously, revitalize the site of the port of Beirut, address socioeconomic imbalances in the country, reduce congestion and promote sustainable development and environmental awareness. Faced within a net public sector, I hope my project contributed to the many private initiatives that are trying to lift the country for what seems a hopeless and extremely dark period. So that's it. I guess we can maybe start with the questions. Thank you, Dean. Um, yeah, if uh, Philip and Giyad are here as well, if there are any questions, um, I guess we can keep it open to the attendees. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was really impressive. Um, so initially, one of the set of questions that I had was about the grain of silos, um, which was well covered by Luna. Um, the, so there was a lot of controversies around whether it should be destroyed or preserved. Um, politically aspects, would you be able to kind of elaborate on those? Maybe Judy um, and yeah, uh, Lena, you guys can have that. Okay, with that question, sorry. Yeah, Juzi, um, if you want to go first. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll begin from a general perspective of the public. Um, I think uh, initially a big, uh, like a big part of the controversy was the fact that up until today, there still hasn't been, um, you know, uh, any sense of closure to the families of the victims of the explosion. So um, a, a large part of the fact why people wanted to keep the space untouched or uh, you know, not intervene onto it was this idea that how can you memorialize something that is still, um, you know, like an open case basically. So the trial has still not been complete, and there still haven't been any indictions in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, any sort of um, uh, collateral or any sort of actual consequences for the people involved. The government in itself is still avoiding um, a trial 
So this really um, adds to the fact that people wanted to keep the space as is because it's a crime scene at the end of the day and the crime is still open. But um, in terms of how do you actually approach it once there is some sort of uh, you know, um, verdict, uh, I, I'll leave that to Lean to answer since she has been working on it so, um, so closely, basically. Yeah, so exactly. Sorry, I think Lynn's breaking up because she's in Beirut. Uh, <laughs> um. Can you, can you yeah, hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so what Judy said explains everything. So the whole idea is not to kind of eradicate the port of Beirut, but to repurpose it. So keep keeping the identity as is. And it's this idea of memory and kind of facing the tragedy that happened in a way of, you know, giving this homage to everyone that was lost or people affected by the blast. And I guess, yeah, I mean, it's a very tough question to answer. What if justice has been made and what happens to the port then? And, and you know, I've never actually thought about it before today, but I think it's very important to, no matter what, keep this as a part of, you know, Beirut's identity of what the port was and should still be, even if it's being repurposed. That sounds great, thank you. Um, I had another question regarding, uh, I think, addressing to Philip. Um, of course, as architects, um, is seen as problem solvers. Um, so there's developers where financial control resides, and then for planners is where policies uh, reside. So notice that you took some political members um, to address your project. Could you uh, explain how you came forward into your selection? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the people I've talked to um, are not necessarily political figures. Uh, I mean, the way I selected uh, those people um, was a very simple um, set of parameters that basically um, ensures that these are not politically affiliated. And when I say politically affiliated in Lebanon, is uh, being affiliated to the political establishment that has dragged the country to this to this situation. So I did talk to um, to one actually political activist. He was a um, a candidate for the municipal elections, so not the parliamentary ones, but the municipal ones. And I think that this was a bit more important to talk to than um, a, a member of parliament because I mean they're dealing to uh, they're they're dealing with um, issues that are direct, directly affecting the urban fabric around the citizens um, of I mean wherever um, the, whichever area they represent. Um, so I mean, in terms of political activists, um, this is um, how I kind of selected that. But then apart from this, there are um, I sp I've spoken with a few representatives from different different initiatives, different organizations. That have either either um, um, that were either born from the blast or the October Revolution, or that existed uh, prior to that, um, and whose obviously work is extremely um, crucial for the for the people of Beirut. Um, and then I've spoken as well to people from the municipality. The municipality itself um, is a kind of political entity because um, the head of the municipality is um, is selected. I mean, is appointed by the parliament. So um, so he kind of manages the whole, or he or she. And I think in this case, it's a, it's a man. Um, he uh, kind of um, approves or disapproves all the projects, um, all, all the urban and um, even, I mean, architectural projects in the city. Um, so yeah, I think, I hope this answers the question. That's great. Um, we also had another question for you um, in the chat. So yeah. what do you imagine uh, would be the biggest obstacle to bringing a project like yours in life uh, in Beirut? Um, I think, I think, because uh, I'm kind of trying to, to push it forward. I don't know if it will happen. Um, but I think the two main problems are first funding. 
um, the way I'm looking at funding is um, to try to uh, appeal to uh, foreign forms of finances. So development funds from either um, the UN or other donors, um, international donors. Um, but then the main problem, I think, is again, the political establishment, because as I said, the municipality is, I mean, in this, at this moment, the municipality is um, basically governed by the political establishment. I mean, it's technically one party of this establishment. Um, and I mean, unless this kind of changes, um, it will be very difficult to implement it. So, I mean, I have spoken with people from the municipality and the way I kind of approached them was not to lay all my cards on the table. So I never told them, for example, the political aspect of this project. It was just, so the way I, I, I explained it, it's a humanitarian project. And initially they were reluctant, but then they told me that if um, these are, this is all for humanitarian purposes, um, the governor of Beirut can kind of allow this to happen and will actually help you. Um, but I mean, yeah, I haven't laid all my cards, so they don't know that this is a long, uh, long lasting project. They don't know how political it is. Um, and yeah, basically, but yeah, so I think the political establishment is the main, um, the main obstacle in this case. That sounds great. That, that's, that answers it really well, thank you. Um, but I think uh, there's another question for, I feel Riyad and both Philip could um, address this one, is in terms of, from an academic perspective, from the university itself, the design project um, has, from art, taking it from architecture, from a creativity to a really political, how did you come, so like, uh, it's, sorry, um, yeah, so how did you make these connections and how did you, the impact they have on your design is one of the questions in the chat. So would you have any advice for students wanting to engage with real life actors in this way? Riyal, do you want to start or? Sure. Um, so it's about how do I take my position? Okay. So basically, um, in Beirut, for many years now, uh, the government has been playing a very kind of uh, negligible role in the sense that it doesn't really do anything. So, for example, in the case of my project, um, electricity has always been uh, uh, scarce in uh, Beirut, uh, so has water. Uh, and so many people, they kind of uh, um, get, they have generators uh, and they buy fuel to fill those generators and generate their own electricity. Uh, many people heat their water using solar panels. Um, they buy water from uh, private suppliers uh, and fill it in reservoirs. Um, and so in a sense, and you see it also in people's attitudes, you know, they, the way they act, the way they they double park uh, and and kind of maybe not stop at a red light because there's no one going the other way. Uh, so it's a very kind of uh, um, anarchist people who are uh, uh, who don't really take the government seriously, you know. Uh, so in a way, it's always been very reliant on their own means to actually, uh, and this was why uh, I was looking at the governments at the scale of the residential building, which is a system, an actual kind of political system that has been set up by the people to make their lives easier and be able to take decisions easier, uh, easily. So uh, um, in terms of the position, I didn't really address any governing forces at all uh, in that sense, maybe just, uh, but this also was a bit counterproductive because in a way I'm not changing anything with my project. I'm just taking a position uh, through the design of it. Uh, um, uh, but what I am doing is actually offering the space for the people to uh, make changes by uh, being able to meet somewhere 
uh, by giving them the space to reflect, by giving them the space to actually observe the city from above, maybe take a new perspective. Um, yeah, so my position was a bit one of refusal of that condition, but without really offering an, art, an alternative. Um, yeah, I hope this answers your question because it's a bit, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, for me, I was thinking a bit more like it's very difficult to actually offer an alternative. Uh, I didn't want my project to turn into this infrastructural project about how to get water into every building or how to build a new kind of electricity factory or uh, whatever. So I was just trying to kind of work within the system that was set up by the people uh, yes, to just express refusal of the way things are today. So within the context is the reclamation of the space in order to provide for uh, new proposals. Um, yes, it was, new yeah, it was basically the reclamation of the rooftops, mm -hmm. which they own, but are currently occupied by the infrastructure that they've had to put up there to compensate for the absence of government. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... I put them in these kind of creatures, not to actually show a bit of irony uh, regarding this. Yeah. Thank you. Philip, do you have a say on the uh, political aspect? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was a bit of a struggle. Um, I mean, reconciling the, the the design aspect of it and then this whole research activist part of it. I mean, at the beginning of the year in September, I had just come back from Beirut. Um, I was in an emotional state that wasn't very stable. It was very, very, very hard after the explosion. Um, so, I mean, it was basically the only thing I could think about. And I just like pushed for it. My tutors weren't very receptive at the beginning. Um, they wanted me to design from the very get go but I spent basically most of term one researching. Um, but then, I mean, as you start um, talking to people, researching, looking at the urban fabric and all of this, uh, seeds like start to grow and then you start to understand how things come together. Um, so, I mean, the architecture itself came midway through the project, I think. Um, and I mean, I don't know, maybe DA is a bit different where um, there's a lot of freedom on how you kind of direct your project. I don't know about other university, how, how, that, how that works. Um, but I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it answers the question, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, there was another question for Lynn. Um, so I'll read it out. Uh, Beirut has a lot of uh, remnant of its history in the form of a built environment um, and destroyed building. How do you think your approach of uh, to addressing places uh, of, uh, of remembrance can be applied to the rest of Beirut? Do you feel like there is a scope of um, reintegrating these remnants into life of the city whilst it's preserving the memory? Yes, definitely. And I mean, the first point is you know the city's biggest charm but it's also caused it's also caused because of you know the continuous i mean imbalance in the economy that always results in either projects that are never being completed or destroyed buildings that can't be you know fixed because of this continuous Im like financial imbalance but i think that is i believe like because we have a super kind of negligent government i think it's our duty and kind of give this repurpose all these kind of historical buildings that aren't being used. And I think Judy gave the example of the egg that came back to life during the, um, that independently came back to life during the revolution in 2019. And there is also a project in the south of Lebanon, which was by Oscar Niemeyer, which was never completed because of financial problems. But I, but also citizens independently. And in Ben Theater, those and yeah, I think it's our role to kind of give these monuments and spaces life again. But yeah, I hope uh, this answers your question because it's all about being independent and setting the government aside. For instance, the project at the port tries to 
teach people, whether it's at the port or people can look at this project and learn for their kind of their own environment, how to be independent and not depend on or rely on the government. But yeah, I hope it answers the question. Yeah, it definitely does. Thank, thank you. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for on my sets of questions. Do you, um, and we are ahead of time. Um, but yeah, do you, does Judy, did you have anything to say? Uh, no, I, I just want to say thank you. Thank yeah. you to the people listening and for the questions. And also a huge thank you to Philippe and Lina and Riyad for doing this. Most of them haven't presented their projects for like four months, maybe. So uh, thanks for uh, doing it again now. <laughs> um, and thank you and uh, Gina for organizing and having us for mm -hmm. choosing the topic as well. Thank you guys for coming. It was really great. Great to see your project. <laughs> yeah, definitely a different change. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Gloria, Philip and Lynn. It was an exciting project. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so I'll leave it up to this and we'll wrap this up.